Welcome to Discovery Church. How many excited to be here today? Whether in person or online, excited you are here with us for part three of a series that we are just diving into the character of David and learning a lot. How many of you guys enjoying this series so far? It's been good? If you've missed them, check them out online. We got them on YouTube, website, all that, part one and part two. Let me kind of catch you up to where we are today. Um, Israel kind of rejected God. They didn't want God as king anymore. And they wanted to be like all the nations all around them and get a human king. And so God uh, was a little bit brokenhearted about this, but he appoints Saul, which Saul was a good candidate. He was. He was, he was a good candidate, but his heart was kind of revealed over time. Like he was more self-interested than he was God-interested. And that kind of showed up manifest in a lot of different ways, in a lot of toxic ways. And because he was a toxic leader, God removed his spirit from him. And, and so he needed to find a new leader. And he finds a shepherd boy in the house of, of Jesse. And, and he chose David, a little boy by the name of David, because he was a man after God's own heart. And kind of that's the undertone of this series is that what we are learning is that we can be men and women after God's own heart. Like we can live our lives in such a way, posture it in such a way before God and people that God smiles on us, that God shows favor, kindness, and grace toward our life. And that's what we see in the life of David. And then last week we studied this fight, just that one chapter, the fight in the Valley of Ella, where, where David takes on Goliath and just with a stone and a sling, hits that giant in the middle of his forehead, chops the head of the giant off, and we chopped some giant's heads off too last, last week too. Amen, somebody? Did you guys chop some heads off? I know it sounds gruesome. Go back and watch it. I'm sorry, okay? It's just, it'll, it'll make sense, you know, if you, if you watch the, the message entirely today. We're going to pick up kind of right there because um, what should have catapulted David into, and it kind of did, into heroism, and, and like, it, it kind of did it first. Like, like everyone, was cha- everyone knew David from that moment on. No one fought the giant, right? No one was brave enough. And here it is, this young boy beats him with a stone and a sling. So everybody knows the name of David from the house of Jesse. And like, he's, so, he's like insta-famous. You know what I mean? He's internet sensation. If he had a shoe line, everybody would be wearing David's shoes. All the girls that were chanting, no, David, David. Like, everybody knew David's David's name. And so what what happened, like Saul sees this amazing, like, you know, like this has got to be God. God did this, and how God was in him and this warrior boy, this warrior child, and he says, This guy needs to come with me and fight in my army and and, and in my battles. And so let me kind of sh- give some, some context to where we're going today in 1 Samuel chapter 18, right after the battle of Goliath, and then I'll tell you kind of where we're going today. It says, From that day. Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. I want to pause right there because there's a very important note right here. It may not seem like much, but this is the beginning. This should have been a sign to David. This was the beginning of the control that Saul would try to assert over David's life. The spirit of manipulation and dominance, this dominating spirit that, that was on Saul and in Saul, that he would not let David even go home to see his family. He was manipulating his life in such a way that he would be the only attachment and relationship in David's life. Fight my battles. Come on, even, even for good things. This is for, oh, it's for the kingdom of God. It's for the kingdom of Israel. You stay right here. Fight. Like, you go and read the story that that Saul didn't even want Jonathan, his son, to be friends with David, and he tried to put a wedge between that relationship. It was almost like Saul did not want David to have any other relationships at all, especially with family and going home, and only with him. This is a sign of a toxic relationship, and you need to identify it. This is a sign of a manipulator. Someone has a spirit of manipulation that that tries to cut you off from relationships and be the only voice of dominance and control in your life. And David should have caught it. We can see it kind of in hindsight. And and before you kind of even start thinking like, yeah, I got, man, I got people, some souls in my life. Okay, let me help you out because like, I, I don't want you to like assign this spirit of Saul or something on someone that shouldn't be. Let me help you out, okay? Because because it's not, the souls in your life are not the people demanding you show up on work at, to work on time. 
That's not the solace in your life. You need to be showing up to work on time. They're, they're not the people demanding you do your job and do it right, okay? You ought to do, you ought to do that or you're not going to be working, all right? Just figure that out, okay? It's not your parents that are, telling, that are asking for your o- obedience even when you don't understand it. It's not, it's not your parents who are trying to get you to be responsible or, or, or even, you know, forgive or love your, love your siblings or something like that. That's not, those aren't the souls in your life. I'll tell you who the souls are. The souls of this story are the mad people, mad men. They're mad men, the mad women. They're, they're doing everything they can to, to destroy you. They're spreading rumors about you and slanders about you, and they cheer when you fail or when you fall, and they pray you fail, and they do everything they can to distract or destroy your purpose. Those are the souls in our life, and I think every one of us would do really well to pause in this moment and not be thinking about everybody else and just take a little look inward and just ask the question, is there a soul in me? Is there, is there, is there jealousy? Envy? Is there a little bit of uh, unhealthy competition? Is there paranoia? Suspicion? Insecurity? Do I feel the need to get even with the people that hurt me, that offended me? Do I, do I, am I threatened by other people and need to like defend myself or undermine them or kind of talk a little bit about them in a negative light so I kind of prop myself up a little bit? Is there a Saul? Inside of me, you got to be really careful with this spirit of manipulation and control and suspicion and insecurity because it, it'll, man, it'll, it'll lead to a very uh, dark end. Let's, let, let's, let me show you in the, in the scripture. It actually says that whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was successful. So Saul gave him a high rank in the army. And this pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from the towns of Israel to meet King Saul. And, and so they're meeting King Saul, okay? And they're singing and they're dancing. And what are they saying? They're like, with, they're, they're like they got timbrels and lyres and they dance and they're saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David is ten thousands. I don't care who you are, okay? If you hear that, you're like, wait a, wait a second, wait a second. What'd you say? Why you gotta do, why you gotta, why you gotta make it like that? Why you gotta draw a comparison between me and him? Why you gotta do that? Here's what the world will do. The world will always try to draw you into a comparison. Okay? Hey, how come you're not like your brother? How come you can't be more like your sister? How come we can't do that? How come we can't have that? How come they get to do that? How come they got that? How come, how come, how come? And we get all these, you gotta be careful from the spirit of comparison. Don't let that spirit don't buy in. The world will try to draw you in, but don't buy into the comparison. Because if it does, and that spirit of comparison gets in you, it'll, it'll destroy you. It, it, it'll, what leads to it, I'm telling you, is, is um, very unhealthy. And if you find yourself on that path right now of, of comparison, of like, like drawing comparisons, look, you, you, you need to get focused and fix your eyes on God. Fix your eyes, because it got, it, got, it got inside of Saul, and this is what happened. Saul, Saul, it says, was very angry, and this refrain, this like lyric, they actually made a song out of it, you know, it was messed up, displeased him greatly, and from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. So we already know that God, that Saul was not focused on God. He was focused on himself, but anytime, look, anytime you're not focused on God, your eyes will shift towards man. And so he's, he's, he's watching the wrong things. He's looking at the wrong things. And comparison will always cloud your calling, the clarity of your calling. Comparison will always cloud the clarity of your calling. As long as you're comparing yourself to somebody else, you will not see clearly what God wants you to do. You'll never be able to see clearly what he's like. Like some of you guys are running. The Bible says that God has a race he's marked out for us. Like is it, and some of you, you're like today, you're, you're running, you're running, but you got your eyes over here at somebody else's race, somebody else's lane, and you're missing all the turns. You're missing all the signals. You're missing what God wants to do right in front of you, and you are distracted by everybody else's race. Look, fix your attention on God and run your own race, because that unhealthy comparison is going to destroy your life. I'm telling you, if you're on that road, you got to stop. You got to realign and readjust. Stop looking to the left, to the right. Fix your attention on God and start running your own race. Because what happens, look, what happens next says the next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul 
And he was prophesying in his house while David was playing the liar, as he usually did. So he did that. He would go, and Saul was going crazy at this time. He was going mentally ill, and David's worship and music would soothe him. And the reason why Saul was going so crazy is because he was so disconnected from God, trying to do what God called him to do, trying to carry the responsibility and the weight of his calling without the anointing of the calling. So he was trying to do it all in his own strength, and he went crazy, which, listen to me, if you try to do what God wants you to do in your own power, it's going to drive you crazy. You don't have the strength, the intellect, the ability, the creativity. You don't have it. You need the... So here he is going crazy, and what would soothe him was David's worship, and he'd come and play and sing, and it would soothe him. But, but here's... Check this out. David's just worshiping. I just picture this. David's like, as the deer panteth for the water so my and, De- and Saul's over here sharpening his spear, just like my soul longeth after thee, and a spear. The Bible says, like he's like, I'm gonna pin David to the wall, and he chucks the spear at David in the middle of everyone. And it says twice, actually, twice he does it. He, not just one spear, but David is just worshiping all of a sudden, he's ducking spears, man, dodging in the in like Saul's palace. And, and so what do you do? Here's, here's what I want to talk to you about today. Like, what do you do when you got people throwing spears at you? Yeah. Okay, and, and so, granted, some of you, I'm probably, you never had a spear thrown at you, but maybe, maybe you have. I don't know, but, but most of you have not had a spear thrown at you. Uh, I'm going to go off on a tangent. Anyway, so, because so, uh, I was raised crazy, you guys. We had some stuff thrown at me. Anyone got stuff thrown around at the house? Okay, then you know what I'm talking about. Maybe not a spear, but a frying pan. Okay, you know what I mean? But uh, uh, a soup. Uh, okay, okay. So here's, 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 here's what happens, you guys. Um, what do you do? Because maybe it's not the spear, but you're getting accusations thrown at you. You're getting people's words thrown at you. You're getting sure the enemy is throwing darts at you in, in your mind and in your heart and trying to lie to you. What do you do in this period where, where, where you feel like you did the right thing. You did the right thing. Man, David was like, just was victorious. And so today I want to speak to anyone in here that feels like you're in a waiting period. A lot of people don't know that David waited 15 years to become king. Like from the moment he killed Goliath to the moment he was crowned king was a time period. A lot of people... They, if you just ask them, like, what happened after David defeated Goliath? Yeah, he became, he became, nope. They skip over 15 years of David's, of David's life. And I'm telling you, it's a, David didn't know it, but he was, he was enrolling in the school of brokenness. You know, God has a university. Few people enroll in it, and fewer even graduate from it. It's the school of of brokenness and that God was, it's a school for anyone, any man or woman who desires to be used greatly by God. And God will use the adversities and the trials and the difficulties you go through to test your character and refine it for the calling he has ahead of you. I'm telling you, he was in the school of, of, of brokenness and he didn't even know it. He was about to go through the deepest, darkest, most difficult valley he has ever gone through, but it would be this time period that prepare him to be king of Israel. And some of you are in here, and I believe that this is, this is a word for our season today, because some of you have been in a waiting wilderness, a waiting period, and I want to kind of talk to you today about what do you do in the waiting? What do you do in the wilderness, what do you do when like the promise is not fulfilled and the dream is not there when it did not go the way it was supposed to go? I was supposed to be king and now I'm, I'm the king of the caves. David starts wandering in caves all over Israel and even in enemy territory, like not even in the promised land. And some of you have gotten to that place in your relationships, in your careers, maybe even in your emotions, in your spiritual life. You feel like this isn't the way it was supposed to go what do you do when you're waiting? Psalm 69, verse 3, David was so authentic. I love, this is David. One of the things that we love about David is his authenticity. He doesn't deny his humanity. You know what I mean? Like, if you deny your humanity, you'll reject all humility. You have to embrace your humanity. Here's him going, I am weary. And some of you are at this place, and you haven't even admitted it yet. Like, like you're in the wilderness, and you're in the, will, the waiting period, but you haven't admitted how hard it is. And so, and so you're not going to, I need you to first like, like understand and receive and acknowledge like, like 
this sucks. It's not the way it's supposed to be. This is hard. This is like COVID sucks. This time period sucks. Mass sucks. This is not good. I'm tired of this, and I'm tired. Why isn't this? Why? That's okay. That's okay. Let's not stay there, but let's acknowledge the reality of our emotions and our humanity so that we can walk in humility, all right? Let's not wear the mask. I am weary. I'm tired of my crying. My throat is parched. My eyes fell while I, what? I wait. I'm waiting for God. I got something. How many of you waiting on something? Is anyone waiting on anything today? Are you waiting for a breakthrough? Are you waiting for your kids to come back? Are you waiting for that? What are you waiting for God to do in your life today? So today is about that waiting period, the waiting rooms of life. What do you do when you are, when you're waiting? Because delays can cause you to drift from God's purpose. It can, in the waiting room, here, a lot of you have been like your passion and your excitement for not only your life, but maybe even your marriage, your kids, and just things. It's just, it's gotten zapped because that's, that's what this delay can do. The waiting rooms, you ever been in a waiting room? Y'all ever been in a waiting room? Zaps you, right? You're like, this day is over. I'm going home. <laughs> I'm not scratching anything off the to-do list anymore. I'm just going home. This is the DMV and doctors to me and the dentist. DMV, doctors, dentists, that's it. That's the only thing on my schedule because I just need to go home and repent after <laughs> visiting. Here's what you need to look, look about your wilderness, you guys. Delays are not denials. Just because there is a time period between the dream and the destiny, God's not yet is not a not ever. God sees what you can't see, and his timing is perfect. So, so what do you do in the waiting? What do you do in the wilderness? I want to help you out today from David's life and his wilderness experience that we just kind of gloss over that is so important because much of our life is going to be spent waiting. Much of our life, you're going to be spent, it's going to be spent waiting. So what do you do? What do you do in the waiting? I hope you take some notes. Let me give you some advice from David's life. Number one, don't stay isolated. Because when you're in the waiting room, when you're in the waiting period, when you're in that wilderness, or maybe even the cave, like, like David, in the caves of isolation, that's where we can go to in, this, in the way. Just, I'm going to go in the cave. Like, I don't want to talk to you. I'm not going to answer the phone. I'm not going to answer the text. I'm going to put up the wall. I don't need to go to that. I don't need to do that. I don't need, like, groups or nothing. Like, I'm good. I'm good. We got this temptation when we're in the waiting period, especially when people are throwing spears at us and we're being tested and going through trials to just isolate ourselves. And I love this in 1 Samuel 22. The Bible says that David had to actually flee the Saul's kingdom and, and, and was running around. And it says David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. Look at this. Look what it says. Where his, when his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. We know this from the story, right? Like, like David's relationship was strained between his father and and his brothers, there was something going on there. We see a little bit of a glimpse inside of the scriptures of what it was, but there was some rejection. There was some lack of inclusion. There was some maybe even uh, perception of who David was or was not that they had as this young shepherd, ruddy boy that just not was not included. He didn't have the potential to be king, the potential you know, to, to be a champion, to fight Goliath. He just didn't have potential. He's overlooked. And so he was treated and mistreated by his family for much of his life. And here's what God did in the cave. The cave of isolation became a cave of reconciliation. Wow. It became a cave of redemption, you guys. And, and, and here's the reason why. Because David did not fight his father. He honored his father. Even when, his, even when his father may have mistreated him, may have not included him, David did not throw stones at his brother, Eliab, he, he made sure he fought the right battle. He didn't fight his brother when he tried to diminish him and devalue him. He knew where that was coming from. He knew that really wasn't him and my brother. No, my fight is against the spiritual strongholds, and I'm not even going to engage you. I'm going to engage the enemy who's kind of inspiring you to try to attack me with this. I'm not going to throw... So here, look, this is why the reconciliation comes. And some of you here need reconciliation. You, have, you need it in your relationship. Some of you need it in your family. I'm believing that God's going to do something today and something's going to be released in this place today. If you sow loyalty, you will reap loyalty. If you sow honor, you will reap honor. If you sow kindness, you will reap kindness. So what do you do in the waiting? Be loyal. Sow honor. Be kind. Don't be isolated. Don't reject people. I love what it says. It says all those who were in distress 
or in debt or discontented gathered around him, and he became their commander, about 400 of them. Check this out. This is the very beginning of David's wandering that started with the distressed, in debt, discontented people. From this group would come the men of valor, the mighty men of David, who were called the 30 in the scriptures. Some of you have read about that, but they were men of renown, that stories and books were written and told about people, listen, who wandered into the cave with David, running, distressed, in debt, and discontented is how they started. Listen to me, you may come into this cave weak, but you're coming out strong in Jesus' name. You may come in overwhelmed and, and confused, but you're coming out with the peace of God. You may, you may come in one way, but you're going to leave another way in Jesus' name. Don't stay isolated when you're in the waiting, in the wilderness. Don't stay. Look, this is why we do groups here at Discovery. Some of you knew it was coming. Come on now. Groups at Discovery. This is why. You can't just come in and out on a Sunday and just go to a conference or go out of town and visit that thing and check in and out. Man, if you, if you really want to walk in what God has called you to, you need to get connected to some mighty men. Come on, to some mighty women. You need to, look, they may start out, and all of you may start out in the same season of in debt. Come on, Financial Peace University. You may start out in debt. You may be discontented. You may be stressed out a little bit, but you're going to come out of that cave together as men and women of valor. Somebody shout amen in this place. Get connected. Don't stay isolated in your wilderness, in your waiting. Number two, Waiting in the wilderness, what do you got to do? Don't give up. Just don't give up. So many people drop out of the school of brokenness way too early. Out of God's university, we say things like this. We go, why do good things happen to bad people? Why do I? I don't deserve this. And maybe you never really say that, but you think it. It's the reason why we give up. It's the reason why we stop. We're like, we're like I shouldn't. Why do I have to? I've been What's the, what's the use here? And, and we reason all these things within ourselves. And it, as difficult as it is to understand, God can use your pain for his purpose. I know that's hard to comprehend, but don't be surprised if God starts to use your testing and your trials to develop your faithfulness. Because that's actually what's needed in this season. He wants, to, he wants to develop. Look, God developed David's character in the cave so he could withstand the pressure of the crown. Faithful people, keep on keeping on. It, when other people give up, faithful people are diligent and determined and persistent. They change and shift their perspective onto God and his word when things get difficult around them. Now, here's the reality. God is more interested in who you're becoming than what you're achieving, than what you're accomplishing. Because what you are waiting for, you're waiting for something, Check it out. You're waiting. You're all, you're waiting. You're waiting. You're waiting for something when you already have someone. And that's what, that's what God is doing in this season. He's, he's perfecting something. He's shifting something because, because it happened too quick for Saul. Saul got, Saul got there a bit way too fast and he wasn't able to work out some of the things in his heart posture. And he started, he, he, he got so self-interested and self-consumed, and, and so he took a different route with David here. It might have been a route of testing and pain, but it produced something different, and God is producing something different inside of you. Through this waiting period, he's producing something. It's, it, it's not about the thing. It's about the person who God is, and what you are waiting for is not more important than God. It's not. It's, it's not more important. Waiting is a part of the school of brokenness. God is measuring your heart. Yes. And, he's, and he's molding you and shaping you to fit your, your calling, your destiny. 1 Samuel 23, 14, it says, David stayed in the wilderness strongholds and in the hills of the Dever of Ziph, just wandering all over the place. Day after day, Saul searched for him. So this was a constant, man. He was, he was not just wandering and waiting, but he was persecuted. He was, he was needing to flee for his life. Saul was every day hunting him, but I love the next sentence. Say it out loud for me. One, two, three. 
but God. Come on. So don't give up before your but God moment, you guys. Don't give up in the waiting room, in the wilderness experience, and in like the trials and the testing. There is a but God moment if you are faithful, persistent, diligent, and stay focused on God. Amen, somebody? So in your waiting, in your wilderness, okay, don't stay isolated. Don't, don't, don't give up. And then number three, don't throw spears. Don't throw. Hey, but they, he threw it first, pastor. I don't care. Uh, don't, don't get caught throwing spears. And this is what culture wants to draw you into. And culture today is just kind of if they, you know, you got to attack back and don't be a punk and like you just sell, you say your truth. Everybody like you need to be, this is just my truth. This is my truth. And I can share my, my truth. And, and culture wants you to throw spears back. And not only, not only that, sometimes we even have the temptation to pre, uh, for a preemptive strike. Like I got to get my narrative out there. I got I to gotta, I gotta, I gotta strike the first blow because, because I, can't, I can't be seen from their perspective and have that narrative out there. You got to be careful. Don't throw. Look, Saul tried to kill David 21 times. 21 times he tried to kill him. But listen to me, men cannot stop what God has ordained. You don't have to be afraid of what men, men can do. Look, God is greater. The God in you is greater than he that's in the world. So don't take it into your own hands and throw the spears. Can you imagine what this did to David in his heart? Thinking like, man, I don't deserve this, and I was supposed to be king, and man, I'm just serving you and serving your kingdom and fighting your battles and not even seeing my family. I'm playing the harp for you, man. You used to like my music and my worship. It was cool, but now I'm like your enemy, and what this is doing to his heart or what it's even done to your heart, the, your waiting room and your wilderness experience and the pain that it's, it's produced in your heart to wait for something you feel like it's never going to happen. Your marriage is never going to get restored. Or your kids are never going to get saved. Or I'll never see breakthrough in this area. And just over time and time and time, your heart, your heart can get rocky. You got to be careful because an offended heart is a breeding ground for deception. This is where the enemy wants you. The enemy wants you offended. He wants you to take offense at people so that he can start to deceive you. And this is what happens when we take offense and throw spears. So David actually had a few opportunities, a couple of them actually, to take vengeance and put, get, put vengeance in his own hands. And here's one of the occasions in 1 Samuel chapter 26. The Bible says they're all in caves, David and his men. And, and Saul's army comes and camps and, and, and like they can see, David can see them, but Saul can't see David's people. And it says David and Abishai, that's one of David's commanders, went to the army by night and there was Saul lying asleep inside the camp with his spear stuck to the ground near his head. Abner, that was one of the main soldiers of Saul, and the soldiers were lying around him. Abishai said to David, today God has delivered you, delivered your enemy into your hands. Now you got to be careful because like God is fighting your battles, but there's going to come a turning point where, where he starts working for you and you're going to be tempted to grab hold of it and say, told you so. Aha, uh -huh, see, I was right. Told you so. Ah, uh, see, I knew who you were. I knew who you were. All right. Be careful. He says, look here, let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear. Man, he, he started this, David. He started throwing spears first. Let me just like one. I just, I know the truth. I already know the truth, man. I just give me one shot, one shot. I won't need to take two shots. Just give me one shot on this and I'm going to squash this. I'm going to squash. Let me just get, let me put it in my hands. God, I'll take care of it right now. Because I got this. I know the truth. I know what's real. I know what happened. I know who I am. I know who he is. Like, just give me this beer, and I'll take care of it one time, one thing. And David says, don't do it. Don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And this is, and that may sound weird, like, dude, this guy's trying to kill him. What is going on? This goes back to David's heart posture of honor. David so honored the king, even when the spirit of God had left him and he was acting evil, like, like he would not take matters into his own hands. That This was David's mindset. If God wanted a different king, then God himself would take care of it. I'm not going to be the hand that removes the anointing or the position of anointing from this king. Far be it from me. I'm not going to take that, that place. He was a man of honor of integrity. I, um, 
I said this quote on week one, that one of the greatest indicators of maturity is how you handle authority. On week one, I shared this, this thought of, this was one of the contrasting differences between David and Saul, how they handled authority. Saul got toxic and insecure and manipulative and would try to control people and, and micromanage and all that stuff. But David was very um, honoring, just a different kind of leader. So this is true. One of the greatest indicators of maturity is how you handle authority. But here's another truth that you need to know. One of the greatest indicators of maturity is how we submit to authority. I know we don't like that word submit. I know we don't, but, but in order to teach David, I have to teach this, this concept of honor and submission to authority, not, to his, not just to his father, but to his king, who is even crazy, who, who would not take matters into his, into his own hands. This is hard for us to kind of, uh, I think, internalize and, and even apply to our life. It can be hard because we live in a country of entitled, whiny, baby, uh, uh, come on, somebody. Uh, but, uh, and, and we've been trained differently. We operate different from the kingdom operates. The kingdom of heaven operates very different from, the, from American culture and society. Because if we had a president acting crazy, there would be picketing, rioting, I'll just vote him out, vote that. You know what we can do is... is Kick them out of office. Let's kick them out of office. And like, just, we, don't, we, we don't like them. And so, and so, yes, there's the need for that here on this earth. Sure, sure, there's all that because man is human and therefore can lie and fail and deceive. But God is not a man that he should lie. And so God's kingdom is operated differently. Okay? It's, it's, it is not a democracy. It's a theocracy. Here we get, we get to vote on everything. We want to vote on everything. Like, I just, I don't want him, and I want her, and I want them, and I just, there's all this division happening. There is never a moment in the kingdom of heaven where God is going to come to you and say, let's vote on it. <laughs> what do you guys, let's take a poll. Never, never is he going to do that. The kingdom of heaven operates through authority. That is the way the kingdom, the anointing of God, th this is so important to God. Authority is so important to God. Like, not I'm talking about like bad authority and wielded authority and stuff like King Saul authority. I'm talking about the God authority, the humble, submissive, like the honoring authority is so important to God. And it so is it woven into the kingdom culture that he put it into the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and your mother. And this is the first commandment with purpose, so that it may go well with you. You'll live a long and prosperous life. Okay? And the, the reason why, 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 why would he put that? In the, because this is so important to being kingdom citizens that we would be separate from this world and the division and the ugly and the jealous and the divisive. And we would step into a different kingdom and be honorable. Men and women of honor. This, is, this was David, what David wrote. And that's why we don't pick up spears. And throw spears. No, 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 no. Because God is the one who says, vengeance is mine. I will pay, says the Lord. I'm a citizen of a different kingdom. And I'm not going to fight like this world fights. Okay? And, and everybody, like, to, you hear the word servant. Like, we're all like, hey, be a servant and a servant leader and a servant this. And we're servant of God. And it's like, be a servant. Okay? But everybody can act like a servant. But the true test is, can you still be a servant after you've been treated like one? No, I'm not advocating for people treating people like servants and throwing spears at people or anything like that. I'm not advocating. But what I am saying is just a heart check for you, okay? Because if you really did see yourself and claim to be a servant of God, why, why would it surprise you when people treat you like one? Why would it surprise you when God treats you like one? No, 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 no. I'm not, don't, don't, don't twist my words or anything and be like, oh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm a joint heir with God. I hear you. Come on now. Stop it. Just heart check, check your own heart here, okay? Because if you truly were a servant, you wouldn't get so offended and try to stand up for your rights and take the spear in your own hand. That wasn't fair and throw the spear at people. <laughs> right? Right. So, so here, when, and you're waiting, and you're waiting. This is so important. This is so important for us. And I believe so many are in like this waiting period. And I think it's because we've maybe even coming out of co quarantine and, and COVID and in the weird culture and society where we're at, but I just feel a heaviness in this, in this word today that, that this is so important for you in the season that you, are, that you are in, that you don't stay isolated, that you really don't, that in this waiting period, you would not stay isolated, that, that you wouldn't throw spears, that you don't give up. And then here, number four, don't stay silent. 
Don't stay silent. Write down this one next to it. Worship while you wait. You're in the waiting period. Don't, don't, don't let it rob your praise and your worship. Psalms chapter 50. I love this psalm. It says, it's the praising life that honors me. Do you know God loves it when you praise him? It honors God when you praise him. As soon as you set your foot on the way, God says, I will show you my salvation. Uh, when you read the Psalms, the Psalms are really expressions of God's styles of worship. Of praise. It's like it's you read all throughout the psalm, there's just praise, praise, praise. There are psalms of just, and David wrote many of the psalms, and you read the psalms, and, and you, every time in our English Bible, you see the word praise. Every time there is seven different Hebrew words for that one word that you get in your Bible said praise. All right, so and the, and the reason for that, you're like, well, why is that? Why isn't just the reason for that is because the Hebrew language is so much more complex. So much more pictorial even. that The words have like word picture with it. So it's almost impossible to find the, di the direct correlation with the English word of, of praise. So what I want to do is I kind of want to, I'm going to dissect like the seven Hebrew words for praise to help you not stay silent in your wilderness experience and start worshiping God the way that God likes to be worshiped. Because this is God's expression. This is the way God likes it. The Psalms are just kind of his, his style guide of how he likes it. And honestly, as you read through all these, like, all these types of praise, it's like it, it resembles more stadiums and concerts than Sunday churches. Right? I mean, when people like, get all excited about their games and their concert and tailgating, all this, oh, that's a true fan right there. We get all crazy and dress ourselves up and wear crazy stuff and shout, like, oh, that's a true fan. You start acting like that in church, and you're not a fan. You're a fanatic. You're weird. What's wrong with you? And I'm, and I'm telling you, that shouldn't be, man. It shouldn't be like we should not give more praise to the world than our God. So... So let's look at this. Let's do, can we do a little Hebrew study real quick? Because you, you cannot, like in his wilderness experience, and David's waiting, even in the cave of isolation, before even the people came, he was there writing poetry, pouring his heart out to God. I'm weary. I'm tired. God, why am I here? Where are you, God? God? God, come to my defense. You are my defender, my rock, and my refuge. He was writing even in the cave of his isolation, you guys. And so we got to study this to understand how to withstand our caves and our wilderness and the waiting period. So write these down. Seven different words in Hebrew for the one word that we see praise in the Psalms. Here's the first one is Hallel. Hallel, to rave, boast, or celebrate. And that kind of looks familiar to a lot of you probably because that looks like hallelujah, right? And the Yah part of hallelujah is God. Yah equals God. So it's Hallel, God. Ray, boast, and celebrate God. Now, if you go look in a Hebrew lexicon, and this is like uh, every pastor in the entire like, world is, has a Hebrew and Greek lexicon in their library, and in every side of, inside of every one of those books, inside of every one of those lexicons that kind of explain the Hebrew words, this halal is explained the same way in every book. It's defined the same way, to rave, to boast, to celebrate, and here's, here's the next phrase. It's not up there, but it's in every book, every definition. To be clamorously foolish. That's what it means to hell out. Yeah, come on. It's got real quiet in here. It's like, what do you mean? <laughs> to be like, like God likes it when you like get crazy. <laughs> God likes it when you, when, you're, when you are like, and we talked about this at Night of Worship, how David just danced and even looked like a fool in front of people, but he was like, I'm not dancing for you. I'm dancing for God, okay? Don't look at me. Psalm 35, 18 says this, I will thank you in front of the great assembly. I will hallel. I'm going to rave, boast, and celebrate. I'm going to be clamorously foolish before all the people. I don't care who is watching, right? I believe that low-key conservative praise does nothing but protect and conserve your ego. I think, I think that, 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 you know, that just does not, I don't think that flies with God. We need to just go out there and praise God the way he deserves. Amen? That he wants that. Like, this is his word. This ain't mine. God says he likes it when you rave, boast, celebrate, and be clamorously foolish in your praise to him. Here's the second one, and that is yada. Not Yoda. Yada, to acknowledge 
in public, and this, you might want to write down the extra, because the word picture here is with the extended hand. So you may want to write that, the extended, and here's the, here's the yada, this is what a yada means. How many of you in here are Christians? Raise your hand. That's yada. I acknowledge, and put, I am a follower of Jesus, and so God likes it when you acknowledge him, when you lift your hand, and you acknowledge God, so God, God likes it. I was I went out to lunch a while ago with a guy who was kind of new to the whole worship thing, and I sympathize with a lot of you because I was not raised in church, and worship was a little bit weird and awkward for me at first, and, 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 and kind of I experienced very similar to what this guy and many experienced. He was telling me like, hey, when we were worshiping at church, like, I don't even know what happened to me during worship. I just, my hand just went up out of nowhere. I'm like, yeah, bro, that's God, man. Just, that's like the way that we were created to worship God. And some of us are holding back your praise, holding back your adoration. And like, God loves it when you praise him, when you acknowledge him. Psalm 138 and one says, I will yada. I'm gonna acknowledge you and praise you, Lord, with all my heart. I'm gonna give you everything I have. Here's another Hebrew word for praise, and that is Barack. Not Barack like Obama, the president. This is Barack, uh, the Hebrew word to bless by kneeling down is what this means. And you may want to, because there's another word picture. Again, Hebrew is so complex. The word picture here is, is like kneeling. You may want to write down the word surrender. This is, this, is what it, this is what it looks like. This is what worship looks like and praise looks like. To Barak is to surrender. I am all yours. I surrender to you, Jesus. Isn't it interesting that the same word for praise can be to be clamorously foolish, to raise your hand, and to surrender? The same word, the same word, kneel, to kneel. You know, all this is the same word that we get. Psalm 103, verse 1 says, Barak. The Lord, oh, my emotions, oh, my soul, you're going to surrender to God. Oh, my inmost being, surrender, kneel down to his holy name. Okay, sometimes you got to speak to your soul and say, no, 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 you need to surrender and submit to a holy God and not to, this is what, that's what that song means. Kneel down, no, 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 don't bow over here, don't get distraught. You bow down, soul, kneel, surrender to God. Here's another word for praise in our English Bible. Zamar, to make music with string, to make music to God with stringed instruments. And I love this word picture. Seriously, no joke in here. The word picture for this is, and hit those strings really hard. That's the, it's a, God, it's, it's not like, God does not want like spa music, like being like that. No, no, no. This word Zamar is like, and rock with it, man, and give it to me. Give, God loves the electric guitar. I'm just telling you that right now. God, he gets excited with the strings and all that stuff. He likes it. He likes it. You know what that means? God is cool, man. God is cool. I just, you should know that. Psalm 62. It is good to hit those strings on that guitar really loud to the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High. I love that. Psalm chapter, this is not your notes, but Psalm 150. There's so many psalms. There's 150 psalms. 150, you guys. The 150th psalms is kind of a good summary of the entire psalms of praise. And it says this, praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with the timbrel and dancing. Praise him with the strings and the pipe. Praise him with the clash and the cymbals. Praise him with the resounding cymbals. Some of you are like, why is it going to be so loud in church? Because God likes it. Yeah. God said, like, that's the way he likes it. You guys, I'm like, and if you don't like loud music and loud worship, you're not going to like heaven, all right? Because the Bible describes the worship in heaven that the worship and praise is louder than the loudest waterfall on earth. That is the praise that is constantly happening on heaven. So, so get used to it, okay? You know what I mean? Because he likes it, man. Let's just get on into it, somebody. Amen? Amen? All right, here's another one. Here's another word for praise is Shabbat. And to, in order to say this right, you got to do the popcorn th kernel thing in your throat. Shabbat. Shabbat. Be careful. See, be careful the hair in front of you. Don't be doing that. I just, I just got you right here. Shabbat. To address in a loud tone, to shout. To shout, God loves it when you, when, you, when you shout, when you scream his praises. And I decided a long time ago, man, I am not going to scream and shout 
for a team and a sports team that does not know who I am and be silent for a God who created me. No way am I going to let that rob my praise. Psalm 63 says this, because your love is better than football. Because your love is better than baseball, because your love is better than golf, because your love is better than shopping, because your love is better than stuff, because your love is better than promotions, because your love is better than the beach, because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I'm going to be loud about it. I'm going to shout God your praises, and I'm going to go ahead and add in the lift up my hand things too while I'm shouting as well. I'm going to worship you with all I got, God. So here's another one. Here's another word. Toda, toda, to lift hands in adoration. Eight, two of the seven Hebrew words for praise have to do with lifting your hands. Isn't that cool? Like God likes it. He likes you to lift your hands in worship. Something happens when you activate that, when you respond and you actually express worship to God. He loves it. The first one was about kind of more like, um, like acknowledging. This one is not like acknowledging. This one is, is, the, is the hands of surrender. The first one was like, yes, I, yeah, yeah. This one is, is more of like, you know, like if someone's like, freeze, you're like, hmm. This is, this is the hands of like, okay, I'm done. I'm done fighting. I, give up, I surrender my pride. I surrender my life. I, I surrender the control. I'm gonna stop acting like I can actually control my life better than you, God, so that's it. I'm done, I'm done. You can, you're, 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 the, you're God. You're God and only you. I'm not a good God. I'm not a good Lord of my life. I'm not a good God of my life. I'm gonna surrender lordship and God to you. I'm not God. I surrender, I surrender. That's, that's Toda, to to lift your hands in adoration. Psalm 50, 23. He who offers praise, who offers surrender, adoration, glorifies me, and to him that orders his conversation aright, I will show the salvation of God. Here's the last one. I think it's the funniest one of them all. Because the seventh one is tahila, which kind of sounds like tequila. You know what I mean? <laughs> And, and, it's, and you get the same result, by the way, exuberant singing. So, <laughs> Check out this verse. It's so funny. Psalm 34, I will extol the Lord at all times. His tehillah will always be on my lips. <laughs> Some of y'all found your verse right there. You're like, I said, no, no, no. That's not what it says. That's not what it says, you guys. Be good. <laughs> hey, don't stay, don't stay silent in your wilderness, right? God likes it. It's the Psalms or this that David has penned in his caves and his wanderings and his waitings and his testings and his trials. All that is like what it reveals to us is, man, in our wilderness and our waiting, in our own testing and trials, we got to lift up a praise the way that God likes it. Not just the way you feel comfortable, but the way that God likes it. I'm telling you, he responds to that kind of praise. Worship is love expressed. Yeah. It's not worship if it's not love. It's not worship if it's not expressed. Some of you are like, you know, I, I love God in my heart. I just, you know, I'm not into the whole music thing, the worship thing, lift your hands, you know, thing. I worship God in my heart. <laughs> How would your wife feel? If you were like, because worship is love expressed. How would your wife feel if you're like, yeah, I love you, honey, in my heart. I don't need to do all that expression stuff, that passion, that, that like, you know, showing you anything. Just know. You're in my heart, girl. That would not fly. Listen to me. That does not fly with God. It doesn't fly. This whole... I love God in my heart thing doesn't fly. Worship is love expressed. And I know it's not you. It ain't me either to, to, do, to do this. It isn't, but it's what God likes. And I'm going to love him the way he likes to be loved. I'm going to worship him the way that he likes to be worshiped. So in your waiting, in your will, don't, don't be isolated. Don't give up, man. Don't, don't quit on. Come on, dude. Stay, stay in this thing. And here's, here's the... The last one I want to give you, the last one, is don't waste your wilderness. Listen, 
your wilderness, you need to turn your wilderness into a training ground. This is a preparation period. God, is, God has purpose in the pain. I'm telling you, don't waste this period. There is a reason for the waiting. There is a purpose in the waiting. And some of us are, are, are wasting it. We're disengaging. We're isolating. We're, not, we're being silent. We're allowing the enemy's deceptions and offenses and spears and accusations to cause us to drift from our purpose. What you need to do is stop wasting your wilderness. This is the training ground. This is the preparation phase for what God wants to do in your life. 1 Samuel chapter 30 is the end of kind of this phase of waiting, the 15-year phase of, Je of David's like wilderness, cave wandering, waiting period of being hunted down by Saul. He doesn't even know it. But in, in 1 Samuel chapter 30, when this, this story that we're going to read right here is actually right after David's hometown and all of his like friends and armies just got attacked by the Amalekites. They took everything. They took all of his family, all of his, the, the, the women, the children, the everything, all their gold, everything took it. They didn't kill anyone, but they kidnapped everybody and burned everything. So it's at this like, I'm telling you, you're going to be most tempted to quit when you're at the closest to your calling. When you're at the closest to the breakthrough, you're going to be so tempted right here, right there to quit. And I just felt like some of you are right here. Some of you are at 1 Samuel chapter 30. And, and in this moment of this that we're reading for Samuel 30, across the way in Israel, a battle, a different battle is taking place and Saul and Jonathan are being defeated by the Philistines and they're about to be killed. And, and, and God is making a way and shifting things so that David would become king and he doesn't even know it. He doesn't know it. It's, it's right there. And I believe that some of you, oh, I sense it in this room today. Some of you are right there. Like you don't even know it. Like you're at, you're at the, you're, you're, you're wanting to give up right now because you see the burn down. You see like things got taken from you. You don't even know it. God's fighting your battle on a different field and he's making a way for you. You're in a first Samuel chapter 30 moment. And here's, look, David was so greatly distressed. He couldn't, he couldn't see what God sees. We can't. We're, we, and so we get to this place where like, ah, the people were even speaking of stoning him because they were so, the, like his people his army, his people, because all of the, look, each, each of them, his sons and daughters were gone. But check this out, look what it says. But David felt strengthened and encouraged in the Lord his God. One translation says that he strengthened himself in the Lord. Hey, some of you are wasting your wilderness because you don't know how to strengthen yourself in the wilderness. You don't know how to encourage yourself. You're relying on somebody else's worship a team to worship for you to get you into the presence of God. Come on, somebody. You're, 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 you're wanting a message to be preached to you, to wash over you instead of being diligent with the Word of God, encouraging yourself in the Word of God, strengthening yourself in the Word of God. And if you don't know how to strengthen and encourage yourself in the Lord, you're going to waste your wilderness. You're going to waste it. And this is why. This is why there is the waiting. This is part of the waiting. God is preparing you. You need to strengthen yourself. You need to learn how to encourage yourself in the Lord. If you don't know how to encourage yourself in the Lord, how is God going to use you to encourage others in the Lord? Okay? So here we are. And, and then, and the Bible says that they actually go and, and, and fight them. Here's what it says. David fought them. It's going to be a fight. You're going to have to fight. Yeah, God's fighting your battles, but there are still battles he wants you to fight. You just got to fight the right ones fight the right enemy. David fought them. He didn't fight the people who were trying to stone him. He didn't, he didn't fight his friends who were, trying to, who were turning his back on him. No. He fought the enemy, the real enemy. From dusk until evening of the next day, and none of them got away except 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Will you receive this? I mean, I, I just, I feel like this is this is for some of you, and if it is, just kind of receive it, man, from, from God. A prophetic word right now, nothing is missing. God is going to recover everything that the enemy stole from you, the people God took from you, the loyalties, the friendships, the, the careers, the finances, the, the, the ministry, the vision, the dream, the strength. God is going to restore everything. Young and old boy, girl, plunder anything else had taken. David brought everything back. And I believe the Lord's doing that right now.
that some of you are in a waiting period and this message is so timely for you because you've been isolated you're starting to disconnect you're ready to give up man you're you're, you're not engaging anymore you're just not even be, you're not you're not engaging in worship you're not praising you're not you're being silent you're just in and you're in this waiting period and you're gonna miss it you're gonna miss it you're gonna waste it you're gonna waste your wilderness and there's purpose here where you are there's purpose in your pain there's purpose in your waiting there's purpose in the delay. I promise you. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. God wants to do something. Can I pray for you, church? Can I pray? Come on, every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm so sorry for going long, but thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you for bearing with me. Come on, just a, a couple more minutes here. Because now it's time to respond. Here, here you've heard the word of the Lord. You heard it, and God is speaking to some of you. I know it today. I'm going to start right here with those of you that just know that God is calling you to surrender your life, to kind of do that whole toe thing, that, that, okay, I give up. I'm not my own Lord, or not, I'm not my own God. I can't control my own life, and it's, I'm not doing a good job at it. So, okay, that's it. I surrender. Just lift your hands kind of in surrender. Some of you need to kind of do that like today for the first time or for the second time and you do it again. Come on, right where you are. I'm not going to have you come up to the front and single you out. One, two, three, lift up those hands. Right, you are. I surrender, God. I surrender, God. I'm not God and I'm not in control. I give it to you, Lord. I give you control. I'm taking my hands off my life. I'm taking my hands off the reins. God, take over my life. I'm yours and I surrender. I bow, I kneel. I praise you, God. Come on, put your hands down, and will you just pray something like this? Right there, if that's you, that's you, you're ready for the surrender. You're ready for the fresh start. You're ready to surrender lordship today to the King, Jesus. Say something like this. Say, Jesus, forgive me for my sins. Today, I surrender my life, and I give you control. I declare you are my Lord, my Savior. Come live inside of me and make me brand new. Thank you, God, for saving me. God, I pray over every person that's here today that's in a waiting, that's in a wilderness. If you're here today, with every head bowed and closed, if you're here today, just, just, these altars are open. We have prayer team that are here right now. If you need to come up and receive some prayer, if you need that today, we are here. We are ready to pray for you. But I just want to pray for you right where you are as well. Wherever you are, you want you to feel comfortable. Whatever you want to do today. If you need to come up, come on up. If you need to, to, to get out of your seat, if you need to activate something, you're more than welcome to do that right here at these altars are open for you. God, I speak over every stronghold right now. I speak over the waiting. I speak over the wilderness, the lies of the enemy. God, I speak reconciliation. I believe you're doing that, God. In this period, this cave of isolation is becoming a cave of reconciliation. So I speak to marriages that need to be restored and reconciled in this house today. I speak to relationships with sons and daughters that you're bringing home and reconciling today. Mothers and fathers that you're reconciling today. You're bringing the hearts of the fathers back to their children, God. I pray that you would do the miracle of reconciliation, Lord. Today, today, God, we seek you, we surrender to you. God, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. We may have came in this place weak, but we're leaving strong. We may have came into the cave broken, but we're leaving whole. We may have came into this cave and this waiting, confused and overwhelmed, but we're leaving with the strength of God more than conquerors in Christ. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for the waiting. You are preparing me. You are molding me. This pain is producing something in me, God. I'm not going to waste the wilderness. I'm not going to waste the waiting, God. I'm going to fix my eyes upon you and run the race that you have called me to. I'm not going to get distracted with what they're saying and what they're doing and what people are throwing at me and what other people get and what other people are. God, I'm going to fix my eyes today. Today, I refocus on you, God. I refocus today and we surrender our life to you. Jesus, have your way in the waiting. Have your way in the waiting. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, give God some praise if you receive that today.